Well, it's good to see everyone. I talked to Mary Sue Kinder twice this week. Um, you know, she was in that car accident and at first she thought it wasn't a big deal. But you know how it is the next couple of days, she is really bruised and having a hard time with the insurance company and you name it. So anyway, pray for her and her, her dog's not doing well. So she, she's having a bit of a tough week here. Well, next week we'll start to resume our study of the book of Judges. Uh, Linda Willenberg sent me a terrific Rose publication on the book of Judges, and it's really helpful to me. But uh, there were 14 judges or deliverers that brought Israel back to where they should be in relationship with God. And you've probably heard several like Samson, uh, Gideon. Next week, we're going to study Deborah, Deborah, the first female judge. <laughs> Not this one. But what we learned last week, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people without godly leaders, and we desperately need them. A country will not be blessed. The parallels between Israel and the United States are extremely similar. Founded by those who love God, then slipping into rebellion and chaos, but repentance and faith in Jesus Christ can lead to forgiveness and return to fellowship with the Lord. So we'll pick that up next week. Looking forward to having Dave Evans here. Um, Emil Summerlad is, is uh, the author of many jokes. <laughs> He's got good sense of humor. Frank wanted me to tell a couple here before he comes up. But uh, I thought a couple of these were good. A recent study has found that women who carry a little extra weight, live longer than the men who mention it. <laughs> Today, a man knocked at my door and asked for a small donation towards a local swimming pool. So I gave him a glass of water. If, if you think nobody cares, whether you're alive or not, Try missing a couple of payments. And then finally, Denny's has a slogan. If it's your birthday, the meal is on us. If you're at Denny's and it's your birthday, your life must be pretty darn dull. <laughs> I thought that was good. But Frank is a blessing. He's a great author, a great storyteller, great teacher. Frank, come bless us, please. We're going to talk about love again. Oh, my. Somebody said love is a many splendored thing. And that really says a whole lot and doesn't say all that much. There's so much about love that I'm afraid we get lost in the forest and, and we just can't see exactly where we are. We talked about loving God, and that's kind of obvious, isn't it? But there's something else that is equally important, and that is loving people. So I gave you a list of 16 reasons why I love people. And we're not going to cover all those. We wouldn't start to have enough time. So let's just tell a little bit of the story and see if we can get a grip on maybe why it is that loving people is so important and exactly what kind of love we are supposed to apply to those who might really just hate us. How does that work? Why does that work? Can we figure any of this out? Life seems to be a little mysterious. We read in Matthew what we call the Beatitudes. 
And somebody played with that word a little bit and they split that apart and said, these are the B attitudes. Would you know that there is a very important B attitude that isn't found in Matthew? What might that be? Jesus said it, but it's not said in so many words in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. And yet it is extremely important. So much so that the Apostle Paul on his final journey toward Jerusalem met with, at Miletus, he met with leaders of Ephesus. And this is recorded in the book of Acts of what was really important to him because Paul knew this probably would be the last opportunity to speak to these church leaders, Christians obviously, what word might the Apostle Paul find so important? What be attitude that wasn't known from the Gospels per se in that message? What did Paul know that hadn't been recorded exactly that way? What Paul said is, remember. Don't forget, this is most important, is what he's saying. It is more blessed to give than receive. Sounds so simple, and it is simple. Doing it might not be so easy because we love the receiving part, don't we? We are born receiving. As a baby, that's all we do as get. Now, I want you to understand that not, not anyone in this room grew up in exactly the same way. And I'm not suggesting that anybody should have a life in any way similar to mine. I, if, if I've discovered anything about the way God is, it's that every one of us live a different walk, a different path. God started us in a different point and he's taking us to a different point. We cross paths and I'm very thankful for those times that we come together. But we're really foolish if we say, well, I ought to be like Jack. I ought to be like Sally. I ought to be like Anton. Why can't I have this? Or why don't they understand what I understand? When we compare ourselves with others, we're just being foolish because that's not God's plan. God has made us all individuals with a different walk. The Apostle Paul said, don't worry about this, because God knows who belongs to him. He says, those whom God foreknew, he predestined. In other words, he has your journey in control. May not think, feel that way sometimes, but he does. He's in control. Even before you came to know the Lord, he knew about you. He, think about it a minute. At some point, you really recognize God and you say, God's more precious to me than anything else. But prior to that, when you went your own way, sowed your own oats or whatever you want to call that, when you were the selfish person that you were from the time you were born, something changed. And there, for all of us, what I'm saying is we all have a different point and we have a different path. I had a quite different path. Most people have a certain day when they say, this is when I was saved. This is when I came to the Lord. And I, that's not who I am. So if I compare myself with somebody else, I say, well, why can't I be like that person? Why can't I have that day? But you, if you heard my story, you might say the opposite. Well, man, Frank's known the Lord all of his life. Why couldn't I be like that? That's foolish talk. We just need to hear and follow the Lord, each of us in our individual path. I was the oldest in my family. Of all my kids, I have three brothers, two sisters. They all came after me, but I want you to know, when I was two years old, I owned the world. <laughs> I had my way. I not only was the oldest child in my family, I was the oldest of both families on both sides. The oldest grandchild, the oldest nephew, I was the one. 
I can even remember learning to walk that far back at a year old because I remember the thrill of taking a few steps and my aunt welcoming me into her arms. What a thrill. I remember some of those things. My dad's a pastor. So we lived right next to what we called the parsonage back in, in those days, right next to the church. So God lived next door to me. Now, we laughed at that, but at two years old, that's the way I saw it. We went on a trip, on a vacation, and I bawled the first night out. I remember this, I was two years old, on the way to, to South, the, uh, South Dakota to see these stone faces we call Mount Rushmore. And I was staying at the hotel, I just bawled, I fall, fell apart. You know what was wrong? I was homesick, because I thought we left God back there. And once I understood that God was with me, I was okay. I'm trying to under, give you some understanding of what that was, how God was really important even at that early age. We pray a prayer. Some of you know a salvation prayer. I have a different one. I prayed it every night from the time I was two years old to I don't know when, but it was the thing I have prayed every night. It goes like this. You may have heard it. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. If that's not a salvation commitment, I haven't heard one. <laughs> At two years old, I could absorb that message. And it meant something. And... Christmas was wonderful when I was so little. We'd get these different toys. I was the only kid in the family. But then, after three years, tragedy struck. <laughs> My sister was born. Now, it wasn't bad initially, because I had a baby doll. Oh, this was what a live baby doll. She cries. She talks. Give her to mom when the diapers wet. But this was wonderful until she got older. Oh, she wanted to play with my toys. My toys. So somewhere as I began to grow, I began to see some importance in learning to share and giving of what I have. Giving is a rather interesting concept that the Apostle Paul advised the leaders in Ephesus, you need to remember this. There's more blessing in giving than there is in getting. We'll repeat that a few times because this is crucial. But what is so distinctive is how it works and why it works. And I hope we can cover that today. You see, we look at love and, and we, we just have this one English word. There are three in the Greek and you probably have heard them before, agape and filio. Eros is the sexual love that we don't necessarily need to cover today. I assume most of us are somewhat familiar with that. Uh, but there is this neighborly love and then there is this unconditional love. Now, for us today, I'm not sure whether this is as easy for us today or easier or harder than it was for the Jews back when Jesus was talking about love. Jesus made a remarkable statement. Do you know what it is? Love your enemies. Huh? Jesus said, loving your friends, even the heathen do that. What makes us different is our ability to love our enemies. I had to learn to love my sister who took my toys. And I did, and now she's a close friend. 
Because now we learn to give to one another. But look at this picture. I want us to be aware that someone could be ready to cut you down, misrepresent you, betray you, tell lies about you. Does that start to define an enemy? And you're supposed to love that person? I don't think that was an easy thing for the Jews to accept. Why? Because I think overall, the general feeling about the law was justice. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. What was right was right, what was wrong was wrong, and people who do wrong need to be punished. And that was the concept. So, loving an enemy, forgiving someone was a rather foreign concept. So I have an idea that Peter was somewhat shocked when he learned you're supposed to forgive someone for an offense. But sometimes, okay, we might do that once, but twice? Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Come on, second time around, no, we don't. So Peter went to Jesus and said, how many times do I forgive someone? I think he was just really exaggerating because once was enough, two was too many, three was absurd. So he said, seven times? And we know he's answering, 70 times seven. Jesus is making this point. Unconditional love has no conditions. You love your enemies. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I'm going to put my hand up. I don't think I can do that. I can't. My enemy is my enemy. I call them my enemy. How can they be my friend? They aren't my friend. They are my enemy. How, what can I do? The point I want to make here is there is only one who is capable of loving an enemy, and that's God. If we can learn to love our enemies, it's going to have to be because God's nature becomes a part of us. Because it's not my nature. It's not the human nature that we have. Because the human nature wants to get and by nature doesn't want to give, and certainly not to an enemy. You know what's unique about an enemy? They're not going to give you anything in return. So much of our love is geared upon what we're going to get. Do you know that most people go to church for what they will get out of it? We are consumers. We eat, we feast, we want for me. And it is a new thing to think of this concept, oh great, I get to give, I get to share. That's my great delight, but it's something I think we have to learn to love in that kind of way. How do we do that? Remember how God loved us. Scripture says that while we were sinners, while we were God's enemies, God loved us. Do we, do we see the nature of God here? So we give. What do you suppose the opposite of love is? I ask people that question and the most frequent answer I get, well, that's kind of obvious, we hear it all the time. The opposite of love is hate. And I'm not going to disqualify that answer. I think it's reasonable. But I think there's something else that might be a little bit better focused on what we really need to talk about. Love, what I consider to be the opposite of love, is greed. The opposite of love that is always giving is greed that is always getting always looking to receive. Love wants to receive for the opportunity of giving. And the grace of God is the opportunity for God to give. 
And there is no greater opportunity to give than when you are dealing with an enemy. And when you return kindness for unkindness, when you return a right for a wrong, what does Jesus say about that behavior? Jesus says you're different from everybody else in the world. When you return love, for hatred and anger, you set yourself up in God's class. That's God's nature. And people will recognize God in you. One of the items on these 16 is the fact that I, in loving others, get to have people recognize God in me. Why? Not because they see my nature, but because they see God's nature. And that is a thrill. I want to let you, know, let you in on a little secret here. I can be devious sometimes. Oh, yeah, I can. There's sometimes method to my madness. We have it here somewhere in our outline. It's Romans 12, 19, and 20. And it quotes an Old Testament verse, amazingly so. We hear, and maybe you've heard this, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. You've heard that before? Yeah. But look, if your enemy is hungry... Prepare a feast for him. If he is thirsty, give him your best wine. Your generosity will amaze him as much as, as, as much a shock as coals of fire being poured upon his head and God will reward you. So follow my thinking here. I want to get really back at my enemy. Tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to love him. I'm going to spread a feast for him. I'm going to give him something different from what he asked for or what he expects. I'm going to smile when he's expecting retaliation. I'm going to show him love. And you know why I'm doing that? That's going to pour coals of fire on his head. That's going to bring a judgment upon him. Wait a minute. What am I doing here? I am leaving the vengeance to God. I can't tell you how liberating that can be when we don't have to pursue justice and we can just love people no matter who they are. We can just let people be jerks without responding to that and becoming jerks ourselves. Right? We can do that. And it is a thrill to do that. I once had a lady at work look at me, puzzled look on her face, and she said, how do you do it? I said, do what? She said, you were just talking to somebody, a supervisor, and they were just chewing you out, and you responded to them like he was paying you a compliment. How do you do that? I thought that was an interesting question. I wasn't, I don't know if nobody had ever asked me that question before. I said, well, how do I do that? Why do I do that? And I decided, you know, it's not because of who he is. It's because of who I am. And it's because of who I am, because of who he is. You see how that works? The more that God becomes a part of us, the more we will find ourselves caring for the person who cares nothing for us. And the glory of that is the possibility that that person might become like us, coming to know the Lord. Jesus talks about how do we, talks about letting our light shine before men. How do we do that? We do that by loving the unlovable. That's our target audience. 
That's the one that we most are concerned with reaching. Some of you know I write, and I work with writers, and I have people who aspire to write something great, a great novel, a great nonfiction book, a great teaching book, and, and so they want to know what I think, and so then I'll say, well, what do you want to do? And basically it's this, I just want to change the world. I just want to see the world change. And I know what's coming because it happens so often. Then I'll say, oh, okay. Uh, who's your audience? Who are you writing to? Well, Christians, obviously. You see a problem there? We want to change the world. And we're going to change the world by going to the people who have been changed. No. You get this? Our mission is to work among our enemies to speak to the people we don't know. And it makes no difference where it is. I am convinced that everyone in this room can be led of the Lord and have a ministry wherever you are. Whether you're at a restaurant, in line at a grocery store, whatever it is, your expression and your tone of voice and what simple things you might say carry with it either a positive or a negative spirit. I don't mean to sound religious in saying that, but there is an atmosphere in the room that comes from the people present in the room. And there is an atmosphere that you have that people sense. We do it subconsciously. But when somebody walks up to you, you have a feeling that this person has a positive or negative approach as, as he or she is coming toward you. We read it so quickly. Don't think for a second that people don't read us wherever we are. And we need that presence of God to reach out from us and to reach out to others. But we've got to learn to give. And that means to practice it. So my challenge for you today is just think about this and look at the list. There's 16 things here. And the rewards are huge. And yet it's so simple and so easy to focus on. Just love people. My definition for who I can love is anyone who has a nose. I'm not sure what I'm going to do if I ever meet a person who has no nose. But that's it. No qualifications. Simply because I know God has no qualifications. I read Peter's words that says, God's not willing that any should perish. And God is loving the unlovable. And that's his nature that we need to have. Not only is there a reward in loving, and that's the experience that I want us to be excited about, but it's also true that failure to love makes us worthless. He did. We're worthless. Jesus uses example after example of what it's like when we fail to love. Jesus said, we are like the fruit on the vine. I'm the vine, you're the branches. You remember those words? And if you are attached to me, basically that's what Jesus is saying. You'll bear fruit and it'll be much fruit and it'll be good fruit. But what does he say about the branches that don't bear fruit? Cut off. Why? Because we were made to love. Do you get this? We were made to love like God is love. It is not definable. I cannot define God's love for you. He is love of a magnitude, this many splendored thing that defies definition. But here's the wonder of it all. We don't have to understand it to experience it. God is love. 
We have God in us who is love and we receive his love and that means we give love. We were created for that. And that, my friends, is the fulfillment of God's purpose in everything we are and everything we do. How important can that be? I begin to understand how it is that the first commandment and the greatest commandment was to love God. And then Jesus turns right around and says, the second is equal to it, loving people. Because that is how we experience God. So it's wonderful, isn't it? What do you think about that? Can we talk about that a little bit? What time is it? Got, it's 10 o'clock and we can spend a little time talking about this. I want your input. I want to know what you think about this. What does this do for you? Anton. You know, as I uh, think back, the person who exhibited this unconditional love was my mother. And she... She would entertain strangers. You know, when there was a knock on the door and it was the Jehovah Witnesses, yep. she'd bring them in, make them lunch, cover the scriptures, which she knew as well or better than I. Jewish friends down the street, she would support uh, the Devorah Hospital. Uh, she gave to every charity that ever asked. And just a, I think back on that, and she really made that as abundantly clear as you are today. But she did it through her actions. Yes. It reminds me of a time, how old was I? Two? Couldn't have been much more than two. And a homeless man came knocking on the door. My mother came to the door. He hadn't had anything to eat for three days just looking for something to keep. And I remember my mother saying, well, using modern language, she would have said it this way. Would you like a PB and J sandwich? <laughs> peanut butter and jelly. But back when I was two years old, we just called it a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. My mother gave my sandwiches to that man. Did you understand this was personal as, as a two year old? The thing that I treasured, the thing that I loved, is now being given to this person that my mother doesn't even know that person. That example, some of those things, I thank God for some of those experiences that have began, began even at that point to teach me how valuable it is to love people I don't even know. Do you think over the years, from what I've observed, sometimes I think Christians are maybe too complacent and we try to follow this examples but what I see is those who are more outspoken cause controversy those that are in control just buckle under them and make changes just to please them new ordinances new laws new things that will gear towards something they want versus what might be right oh that's such a great comment what drives us I think it come, the core of this is what's our motive and is, is this so that I can help someone or is this so that I can get something from the experience? It's simply a matter of putting the horse in front of the cart because one of the items that you'll see on this 16 is there is a great reward for giving love, but it's the motive in which comes first. And, and I think we need God's help to make our motive right because the externals may look the same. Does that relate to what you're saying? Sorry, but it just seems like I can remember when I was a teacher, I could not have SCA in our school because the administration said we're not going to have religion in the school. Okay. But every day I had a Muslim student who could miss my class and go and pray every single day at the same time. And I just, and I never said anything and I never thought about it, but I think maybe sometimes we are too complacent ah. in what we see that is happening out there because they want to appease others because they don't want the trouble or the problems of it. Okay. Here, let, let's look at it this way. Paul talks, writes to, to Christians and says, are you so foolish having begun in the spirit you're going to be made perfect in the flesh. 
And when we just love people out of form as a ritual, it's dead. So when we love others, I think it has to be, or at least we want it to be, an expression from our heart. And not everybody loves in that way. If you're a millionaire, you'll have a million friends. But that's not really the kind of love we're talking about, is it? So I think that the, the key thing here is the fact that we've got to have the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, working in us to let His love flow through us. And that doesn't fit everybody. That's not where everybody is. And maybe that's not exactly where you feel like you are right now. That's okay because God is moving you on that journey different from everyone else in the room. And your love will increase and your expression of that will improve as long as you're wanting it to improve. I hope that helps. Uh, just, 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 just what I've observed. Well, and, and I agree with you. And I have one other thing about someone else. That's my father. Well, Debbie's back there. Go ahead, go get, no, get her. I wanted to give us a little bit more time to talk well, about this. The one thing that really stood out to me, not so much today, but when I taught uh, love in a devotional, was that one from Corinthians, uh, Corinthians 13, 2, year number 5. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people think of that chapter, the love chapter, and they think of, oh, love is patient, love is kind, and that's what they remember from it. But it's this verse here that you put that made such a strong impact on me because when I say that if I knew all of the secrets of God's plan, in other words, if I could look in this room and say, okay, you're going to die so-and-so, and, and we're going to have a stock market crash here, so sell all your investments. If I knew all of God's plan, it's saying that's still not as important as love. And that just sort of made an impact on me, that particular verse in that chapter, more so than love is patient, love is kind, and all that that you hear all the time. Yes. Got Debbie and then Kim. Okay, so um, I have this thing about unconditional love that I never understood. And it's very hard for me to grasp it and then grasp it and understand, internalize it, because I never met. So, um, but I see in the Bible, and then what you put, the number 15, it says, be from perspective that I don't have, perspectives that I don't have. And when the, in the book of Proverbs says, where there's no guidance, people fall. But with the good advice of many counselors, there's safety. So I see here a counsel from Jesus himself, and he says, you know, if you do good to those who uh, do good to you, what in it yes. has even evil people do? Right. Do. Um, in the way that, so I, I choose to love people. Sometimes I don't like people, but you know, how it goes. Some people don't like me sometimes too, but <laughs> it's about love. So uh, the way God designed me is that there's a, there's this hormone called oxytocin. I was reading about this this week. Is that there is a huge level of this hormone, hormone which which is called the the hormone of love. It it means that when whenever you do something to someone, not expecting to get back, a huge amount of this. A hormone is, is, is released in your body and it regulates stress, it balances out stress. So for example, if I am at um, a drive through Chick-fil-A and then I decided, you know what, I'm going to pay for the person, I'm not saying that you have to do that, but just an example, I'm going to pay for the person who is behind me, so you tell the cashier, yes. you know, just pay for the, the person, and you leave, you drive off, and then you don't even know who the person is, so you feel so good about that, so this huge amount amount of this hormone is releasing your body. But guess what? When the person who gets and finds out that you did that, the same amount of hormone is releasing his body also. And guess what? The cashier who witnessed will have the same amount. So we are made to love one another. Yes. 
So then we can build off that, and then we can say, oh, okay, then I'm, I'm the one who's taking these orders and then want to pay it to the next one. So what am I going to do if I'm working at the fast food place? I'm going to tell the next person, well, would you like to pay the one back there? Yeah, I'll do that. Okay, would you like to pay for the next person? And then finally it gets down to somebody, would you like to pay for the next person? That'll be $85.54. <laughs> and he says, no, I don't think so. The price is too high. So let me give you a little, a little story here that maybe fits into back to what Linda was asking as well. I was attending a writer's conference in downtown Fort Worth. And the homeless people circulate around there a little bit. It's nothing unusual to have to see somebody walk in the streets and needy. Uh, as I'm leaving the conference on one day, there's a fellow who walks up, he's carrying a few things in a plastic sack and wanted to know if I could give him $5 to get to Dallas to see his mom. Now this might sound like a sob story and I want us to know that loving people, you can't satisfy all the needs of this world. You can only best satisfy the needs that God leads you to satisfy. And so when this man asked me for some money, what I sensed in my heart was this guy's plea is genuine. His mom really does have a need in Dallas and he really wants to get to see his mom and he can do that. And I pulled out from my wallet a $20 bill. And oh, you would have seen the man's reaction. He was overwhelmed. And I blessed the man in the name of the Lord and he went on his way and I have no idea whatever happened after that. I don't know and maybe it was just all fake. I don't know. What I know is I answered the, the feeling that I had in here. But here's what's interesting. The next day, the same kind of thing happened. Another man just happened to walk up, and, and there weren't any other people around. It, it's, it's as if God ordained this to say, well, here, this happened the first day, now I want to bring you somebody else on the second day. And this man walked up and had a different story and wanted some money, and I told him I didn't have any. Do you understand what I'm saying? I had money for the one because I felt led to do it. I didn't have money over here because I didn't feel it here. If we can be led by the Spirit of the Lord, and I understand this is a challenge, and this is not always easy to do, but we can do it as well as we know how to do it. And so why don't we try to do that? Why don't we do more of that? And, and so I, I thought that was an interesting experience, and I learned from that to just be sensitive to what the Lord might be leading me to do even though sometimes it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Okay. I had the same experience. Um, somebody approached me and I gave him a $20 bill and then I decided I was just going to sit in my car for a little while. And he didn't see me sitting there and I watched him go into a liquor store and, you know, spend the $20 on liquor. And I was so upset until the Lord said to me, I judge you on what you do. I judge him on what he does. That's and good. all of a sudden I knew it was right that I gave him the 20 because yes. it was right for me to do. Yes, so. that's helpful. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
how do you love somebody that has beaten and tortured you until you are forced to sign a confession that you, in your handwriting, that you have committed crimes against these people, that you condemn your government, and uh, finally, that you thank these people for their lenient and humane treatment. How do you ever get past that? My simple answer that I know is still difficult, only by the grace of God. Only by the grace of God and his only way. It is God's nature, it's not our nature. I don't know how many times I tell myself, Frank, let it go, let it go. But that's me telling myself to be somebody I'm not. Because I'm telling myself let it go when I haven't let it go. And where's the power come from to make that possible? Only in the Lord. That, that's the only place. And when it hasn't happened, it hasn't happened. But we can't quit knocking at God's door. Because that's the only door. There's not somewhere else we can look for strength. Because he is our strength. And if we're needing strength... We don't go knocking on somebody else's door just because God hasn't given us the strength we need, just because God hasn't given us the guidance we need, because God is providing what we need. There is this journey, and, and sometimes I find it difficult to accept that I have to go through the hardships I go through. We all have them. And so easily I could say, well, God, why didn't you do something sooner? Or why didn't you do something differently? And I have to let it go, let it go. And it's a, it's a constant challenge. It, does anybody else experience this sort of thing? I, I think it's fairly common. Uh, Dave, we need to pick up Peggy too. Mine would be pretty quick and to the point. Number one, a uh, great subject is evidenced by all the questions and comments coming out of the uh, people here today. Uh, the simple thing I want to identify is that I have friends who will say, now you owe me one. Or they did. They gave you a ride, or they gave you something, <clears throat> and they keep track. Many people keep track of. Okay, I did this for you. I want you to come back and do it for me. And they have an expectation that you know we got to get something back if we may give something. Yeah. And I see many, many people like that, and I see some who just say, "Hey, I'll keep track of it. If you need help, you tell me ten straight times, and I'll respond." It's not a case of you owe me something. So that's just my observation. Very good. Just a week ago, I told my doctor, I said, I will always owe you because of his special care that he gave to my wife for four years before she died. And he said, you don't owe me anything. And I said, yes, I do. Uh, so it's an interesting dynamic that goes on there. And he's a strong Christian. And he, and I go to see him once a year for a checkup just so we can talk about the Lord. Uh, that, that's a thrill. Peggy. This is a difficult teaching, particularly in a situation where a woman has been severely abused. Yes. Um, and when you really think you're going to love your enemy, and somehow or another you're going to change them by the love of God that's going to come through you, and you end up, say, being beaten to a pulp, whether that's physically, emotionally, mentally, or psychologically. And so the danger is, in my mind, yes, we're to love. Yes, that is a commandment. Yes, that's all true. However, what you just said was very the most critical point to me. It's the how that's going to be manifested. It yes. comes from the Lord. Yes. There may be a time when God says, you have given love as much as you can give it, but now what you need to do is step away and let that person experience the consequences of their behavior, and that is a loving act. Yes. And so um, our love in the natural, the way you say, in other words, for a long time I interpreted that as though it was up to me to go and try to love as hard as I could, mm -hmm. and that was being godly, and that was going to change the situation. Well, it doesn't. The love of God is the only thing that changes that person. And, and the only help I got, which was different than Ken's situation, because he couldn't get out. My situation, it, you can walk out. But, the, but the, the difference is what I began to pray is, Lord, I know that you died for this person, and you don't want anybody to go to hell. You died for them. And so I'm asking you to meet with them. I'm asking you to meet with them one way or another. 
that you because God loves me too. Yes. And he's concerned about my health and well-being. But that's up to him. But then it's my job to love myself enough to step away and to love them in a different way, which may be at a distance, and to do use intercessory prayer for that person to come to know Jesus and then have a true change of heart. That's just my Isn't that our greatest motivator for prayer? for what we can't do in love, but we want to do. I can't walk by someone in a wheelchair, but wish I could just pick them up out of the wheelchair. But unless God does that work, I certainly don't have the power to do it. So we pray for all those things that we can't do. And at the same time, we do what we can do. So Barbie, um, you told me something very, very special about the care, um, Corey Tenbull. We want to share with everybody. Okay, <laughs> so tell me if I'm told, saying everything. Well, okay, so you know Corey Tinball. She was in a concentration camp, and then her sister yes. was um, assassinated. Yeah. So, um, so she went after all that that finished, so that it was over. She was giving her testimony at one church, and one of the 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 person who were in the Nazi torturing her actually was the one who killed the sister by beating her up and um so he's at the door and she's supposed to go in and shake his hand and she's like god i cannot do that i cannot shake hands with the same hand who tortured my my sister to the point of death but then she heard god telling her it's not you it's gonna it's me i will be doing that and she said it was she felt like it was a God was putting some gloves in her hand so she could, through the gloves of God, shake the hands of the man who killed his sister. Yes, I know of many stories like that. And it only happens by the character of God that works in us. Uh, I have a friend of mine who wrote a story about a man who lost his whole family and did his, and lobbied with the state of Texas for the murderer to not suffer the death penalty because of his love for the one who killed his whole family. That's impossible apart from the love of God working in us. You know, that's why it's easy to love the lovable. Yes. But when we can love the unlovable, that's when it's even greater. And the point I want to make is that is God's challenge to us to be different, to not be like the world that loves the lovable, but to love those that are not lovable. We, we could continue on till kickoff time if you want. No. <laughs> one more. Does somebody else have one? What did Jesus say on the cross? That's what he did. That's what he did. Lord, thank you for this time that we've had together and all the discussion, the input. I've drawn strength from it, and I trust that many of us here have been able to draw strength from your word, that we've been able to be led by your spirit to some new way that we will find throughout this coming week to be able to express your love to others, people we don't even know, and maybe even those that would have something against us, Lord. Let your light shine through each one of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I am a roaring lamb. I am a roaring lamb. And the time has come to take my